This year has changed us, challenged our resilience, tested our hope. But today, we reset, navigate our way through the economic uncertainty to redefine this moment. With courage, we empower ourselves to restore our financial dreams. Stronger, braver, ready. Starting now, we rebuild and we invest in our futures. Good evening, I'm Jim Kramer. And I'm Kelly Evans. As the coronavirus hits another grim milestone, with the U.S. reporting its second highest day of new cases, we all feel the weight of this global crisis every day. But we also need to feel our way through this and find a way to move forward. Tonight, you'll meet extraordinary Americans. From frontline workers to small business owners to the class of 2020, their financial lives upended by the recent health, economic, and social crises. But they are determined to find a path forward. NBC Universal and Comcast Ventures are investors in the financial wellness app Acorns. We're all teaming up tonight to help these folks reset and rebuild their financial futures. Tonight, we're also <laughs> celebrating homegrown heroes, Jim. Yes. I mean, look, the pandemic may have sent us into isolation, but these people responded, Kelly. They stepped up to serve their communities, and their neighbors took notice. At the bottom of your screen, we usually run a stock ticker. That's what I'm familiar with. A scorecard of how companies are doing throughout the trading day. But tonight, tonight we replace the heartbeat of Wall Street with the heartbeat of America. Neighbors saluting neighbors. And this is a town hall. So tonight, we're connecting with you. We're answering your financial questions. CNBC's senior personal finance correspondent Sharon Epperson is here with more on how that's going to work. Sharon? Good evening, Jim and Kelly. It is a thrill to be here tonight, and we have so much to tell you about. You know, we've talked a lot on CNBC about the great disconnect. What's happening on the in the stock market is not happening on Main Street for many Americans. They're struggling. They're uncertain about their future. And tonight, we've brought some top experts to come in and help. They're going to be on Facebook, members of our CNBC Financial Advisors Council, to answer questions that people have about some of the most pressing issues they're facing today. How do I protect my retirement money when the market is uncertain? Should I pay off my student loans right now? Well, you have many questions, we're sure, and we have several advisors that are ready to answer your questions on Facebook. So head right over there, and we will get you some answers tonight. Thanks, Sharon. I always love working with you. Don't get to do it enough. You are terrific. And for our Spanish-speaking audience, we are partnering with our sister network, Telemundo, tonight. CNBC and Acorns contributor Janet Alvarez is standing by. Janet, how are you doing? Good evening, Jim and Kelly. You know, the Latino community has been particularly hard hit by the pandemic, and our friends at Telemundo have been helping many Latino small business owners find their way forward with their Nuestros Negocios initiative. But it's not just business owners that have been affected. Many have had their financial lives upended. So tonight, we're answering their questions on the Noticias Telemundo Facebook page. Go to facebook.com slash Noticias Telemundo. Gracias. Thank you, Janet. We all appreciate it. Let's get right to our first story. And tonight, we start on the front lines of the coronavirus pandemic. My name is Jador La Rosa Mantis, and I am a registered nurse here in New York City. I live in West New York, New Jersey with my husband, Stefano, and our two-year-old son, Amir. I can't put into words the feeling when I held him near my arms for the first time. I wasn't raised with a father. My dad left when I was a couple of weeks old. So having now my own family and my child, it's one of my greatest accomplishments. <laughs> When COVID-19 happened, my life changed dramatically. I had to move out of my home, stayed in a hotel for three months, and my decision really was to keep my family safe. Being on the front line working every single day during this pandemic was very scary because a lot of times people don't see what goes on behind the walls of the hospital. The hardest part is 
see patients dying in numbers that I haven't seen in my nursing career. One of the things that I did to cope during this pandemic was to keep a digital diary and write in my phone every day to my son, Amir. The day I was reunited with Amir, I was very, very nervous. It was truly emotional, very, very emotional, but, but it was a great feeling just to have him in my arms again. It also had let me realize that how fragile life is and how much we have to just appreciate the fact that every day standing above ground is a blessing. Jador joins us now. Jador, first of all, thank you so much for your service and for your sacrifice. I have a two-year-old. I couldn't imagine being away from him for several months. So thank you. And thank you to all the nurses in America who have answered this call and done the same thing for your families. Jador, I know you're dedicated to serving your patients with the utmost care. You're looking to advance your own career in that regard. I know you're studying to become a nurse practitioner. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about, I know you have a lot of student loan debt, $80,000 worth. We'll get to all that in just a moment. But first, Tell us what made you become a nurse. Hi, Jim and Kelly. Thank you so much for having me here today. It's really hard for me to talk about my reason to become a nurse and not talk about the struggle I had to overcome. When I was 15 years old, my grandfather was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. Um, my mom was the sole breadwinner of the house. And at that time, my siblings and I was the main caretaker of grandpa. We were very poor, we did not have any insurance, and each day I would see the look in his eyes of the agony and all the pain that he was going through. And in that moment, I realized that I wanted to learn more about the human body and disease process, and it propels me, rather, to move forward and to become a nurse. But also, Jim, it's very hard to, just to think about the challenges that I had to overcome in my um, quest to become a nurse. I moved there from Jamaica when I was only 16 years old. While in nursing school, unfortunately, I was homeless for a semester and a half. And again, it was very hard, very challenging, but I continued to move forward. And this was real. My calling was evident during the COVID pandemic. You know, I remember my most difficult day in the job as a nurse during the pandemic. Um, we had a patient who coded and everyone on my team, the doctors and the nurses, we try everything in our power just to get a pulse, just to keep her alive. And during that moment, during her last moments rather, I could see the tear. I'm sorry. That's right. I, I saw the right. tear of her just rolling down her face, you know, it's it's really stuck with me and it's it's very hard sometimes just thinking about all the things that we have to go through. But, you know, we, we kept moving and we supported each other. You know, I'm very grateful for my job and my manager, my nurse manager, Mr. Hudson, and all the nurses on our team. They were, we were very supportive of each other, very cohesive team. And I couldn't have done this. I couldn't have made it through the days that I had without the, the team effort. Well, and I'm really grateful for that. Zidora, you're... First of all, I gotta thank you for, your, for what you've done and what your team has done. And I know it's difficult. Uh, after listening to that, I always feel like, wow, what are we doing talking about money? Because what you've done, what service you've done, what you've seen is, is beyond what I'd say 99% of this country has seen. But you know, we gotta talk about your finances right. because I know you've got this debt. We've gotta deal with it. You have $80,000 in student yeah. loan debt. You got a mortgage. Uh, and this happens no matter how much you serve, you get stuck with this stuff. Tell me your financial plan. So my plan is I really want to pay off my student loans. And at the same time, I want to save for Amir's college education because I don't want him to end up in the same position that I'm in right now. You know, I go through the challenges. I love my job. I have an amazing career. But at the same time, I have this debt that's hanging over my head. And I really don't want to have that for my son. So I just need some advice and some help, and how can I go about doing that to make sure that he's not going to be in the same position 20 or 30 years later? All right, first of all, remember, most of the country's in your position about that, but we got to do something about it. So what <laughs> I want to do right now is I want to welcome in Tara Falcone. Now, Tara's a certified financial planner, founder of Rise Up, and I got to tell you, I think she can help you. Jador, 
Uh, I believe you have a question for Tara. Hi, Tara. Hi, Shador. Um, so, Tara, my present um, question that I have that I hope you'll be able to give me some insight is, what do I prioritize now? Do I prioritize paying off my student loans or do I prioritize saving for mere college expenses? That's a great question. And hello, Jim and Kelly. It's really an honor to be here. Uh, my sister actually had COVID. She was hospitalized for a couple of days and luckily she pulled through thanks to healthcare workers like Shador. So I know, you know, I am so grateful uh, for people like you and it's wonderful to be able to give back right. in a setting like this. Um, you know, I've had the pleasure of getting to know you and your beautiful family over the last couple of weeks. And, you know, like you said, like many Americans, you're struggling with how you can, you know, build wealth for the future and security for your family while feeling weighed down by this debt that you've accrued in the past. Um, so, you know, I want to tackle kind of the student loan question first. Uh, I believe that knowledge is power and that having options is empowering. So the first thing I would suggest that you do is call your student learn loan servicer and ask two questions. The first is, how much of my student loan balance actually qualifies for forgiveness? And the second question okay. is, how much will actually be forgiven if I make those 120 qualifying payments? Once you have that information, you can then decide whether you want to pursue student loan forgiveness or if you would rather save yourself kind of some stress over the years and just pay them off aggressively yourself. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, as for the college funds, uh, you know, I think that student loans, you have to really kind of tackle that first because I know that's taking a mental burden on you. But when it comes to saving for Amir's college education, the first question you have to ask yourself is how much of his education do you really want to save or to pay for? I know that your answer is 100% because you don't want Amir to have student <laughs> loans like you do, right? Uh, right. But if, if college is that's going correct. to continue, that's correct. So if college is going to continue to be as expensive as it is today, uh, we've, we've crunched some numbers and we found out that you'll actually have to be contributing roughly double what you're currently contributing to his uh, college savings accounts. And I know you had a question as well about what types of accounts should you be putting this, this money into for his college education. So I know you already have a 529 plan. I think that's great uh, because it provides you some tax that's benefits thinking, with paying yes. for education expenses. Uh, but you know, with all the uncertainties surrounding higher education right now, I actually think it might be smart to separate the money into two different accounts to give you some options. So have okay. that 529 plan there, right. but then also consider accounts like a Roth IRA or a backdoor Roth if your income is too high, a brokerage account, or even a new college or child savings account from Acorns called Acorns Early. And what having those two pots of money will give you is flexibility and options when it comes time for Amir to go to college. And Tara, let me ask you, what for people who are struggling whether to pay down their own debt or save for their kids' uh, future college costs, what should the general priority be? Should it be to make sure that you're squared away first, you know, that that's the best way to take care of for the next generation? Or should you try to prioritize that college savings before even some of your own finances? You know, it's a delicate, it's a delicate balance, absolutely. And I think that at the end of the day, there aren't loans for retirement. So you really need to focus on getting rid of your debt as quickly as you can and then doing the best to, to balance saving for your child's future. Obviously, you know, you don't want to wait too long to start doing that because then you can't rely on the market to do as much of the heavy lifting for you. Uh, but, you know, when you're thinking about our generation who may have to be shouldering, you know, our, um, our parents' expenses or some of their healthcare expenses or taking care of them in their old age because yeah. they've had all of this debt, uh, you know, personally, I would prefer that my parents pay off their debt um, and then I can kind of figure out what that yeah. looks like for me college-wise. But, you know, unfortunately, none of us really know what higher ed is going to look like this year, let alone 16 years from now. Sure. Uh, so take care of the debt that you have I know and, it then, feels, and then focus on that. Yeah, I was just going to say, I know for a lot of people it feels selfish to take care of themselves first. It's not. You know, it's also how you take care of the next generation. Tara, thank you. Thank you so much for all your advice tonight. Thank you for being on the financial front lines with Shador. I know you're going to continue to work with him. So we all appreciate it. Thank you again. Well, that was some thank great you, advice. Kelly. That's great advice, Tara. <laughs> Kelly, I'm getting more from you than I'm getting from you. We're going to have to sit down after this and figure out my finances. Right, Jador, you should be fine, Jim. You should I would be love fine. it. Jador, your service has not gone unnoticed at Mount Sinai West. Joining us now is Rich Friedman. Rich is the co-chair of the Board of Trustees of Mount Sinai. He's also chairman of the Merchant Banking Division 
Well, my old haunt, Goldman Sachs. Rich, welcome. You've been listening and wanted to say something to Jador. Thanks, Jim. Jador, thanks for sharing your story tonight. I, I have to tell you that you. Um, I really admire you for your dedication and commitment you know, to Mount Sinai, and you have a, a lovely family. Um, you know, from the beginning of this, um, you know, surge that started in mid-March, you know, I was thinking of you, and I was thinking of your, your, your colleagues, and we were all doing whatever we could to provide whatever we could to protect you, so you could basically serve, you know, serve our patients well, and we work really hard during this period. But every night, I went to bed thinking of what you guys were going through. Now, we lived through that surge, um, and, um, you know, now we have a little bit of a reprieve. I, I will say that, you know, we're, um, so we're still thinking of you and, the, and your colleagues because this is a time when others shouldn't be putting their health, you know, um, you, know, uh, y you know, at risk. They should be coming to get your services from the routine care and the emergency services, and, and this is a period where we want to take care of our community. And, you know, during the period, we, we saved thousands of lives, and, you know, I could see how emotional you were about, you know, watching some of the people that you did everything possible you could to take care of them. And this is going to be historic for you. You're going to be, you're going to be able to tell your children this, the stories of, um, of what you went through. Now, you know, Jamie Kelly, I want to thank you for what you're you know, doing tonight to shine a light on those who've been impacted by the pandemic. And uh, we're proud to have you part of the Mount Sinai family. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very happy to be there and to be working with such an amazing staff. Thank you. Wow. Jador, thank you so much. Rich, it was so great that you called in. Both of you are heroes. Just terrific. Yeah, and we're just getting started tonight. Coming up next, it's a tale of two generations. You're going to hear from these four members of the class of 2020. They just graduated into the pandemic. What's next for their financial futures? Also, a small business owner from Seattle. She's lost half of her business. She's now worried she won't be able to fully retire. Advice from Susie Orman when we come back. Welcome back. Tonight we're talking to everyday Americans impacted by the pandemic. Our job is to help them figure out their financial path forward. There are nearly 4 million members of the class of 2020 who graduated right into this crisis. Let's meet four of them right now. Welcome Denny, Tariq, Sydney, and Juvie. Denny, Hi. why don't we start with you? How has the pandemic impacted your life? Hi, uh, I'm Denny Budman, and I just graduated from Boston University with a degree in film and television production. This January, I was thrilled to start my dream internship that I had my sights set on since freshman year. I really thought that it would be the launch of my career and my job there would turn into something bigger and better after graduation. In the end, I worked there for just two months until I was laid off with the pandemic. Ever since, I've been working hard to keep up my creative momentum by doing freelance video projects, whatever I can do as a one-woman crew, and I'm actively looking for opportunities to continue learning and make my way in the film industry. Boy, I bet you will. I bet you'll have some success, but I know it's going to be tough right now. How about Tariq? What are you up to? Hi, my name is Tarek Ziad. I graduated from Yale University with a BS in Ecology, BA in Theater Studies, and honors in both my majors. I was a first-generation low-income student with a full ride through scholarship, and my plan post-grad was to combine my two very different majors by teaching at the Bronx Zoo during the day and pursuing my career as an actor, auditioning in the city at night. However, I lost my job at the zoo to the coronavirus pandemic and have been looking for new work in entertainment, ecology, or education since. Got to stick with it, my friend. Got to stick with it. Sydney? Hi, I'm Sydney Taylor. I just graduated magna cum laude from Fordham University with a double major in psychology and sociology. Before the pandemic, I was working in a lab at Fordham as well as a lab at Columbia University Medical Center and conducting my own research. Unfortunately, I was working at interviewing at some of the top psychiatric facilities in the country, but due to COVID-19, everything came full stop. So right now I'm home, I'm networking, and I'm working towards applying to jobs once these hiring freezes lift. Well, you got it. Wow, these are tough stories. What a class. How about Juvie? How about you? Hi, my name is Juvie Ann Ignacio, and I'm a first-generation Filipino-American. I recently graduated from my dream school, the Fashion Institute of Technology, 
majoring in fashion business management with a triple specialization in product development, buying and planning, and fashion management. And I ended my semester with 3.9 GPA. And my final paper on Princess Diana's wedding dress was published on the FIT fashion history timeline. But due to the COVID-19 pandemic, my spring internship was cut short. But I'm currently searching for opportunities in product development. Oh, these are some smart kids, but I know they're not alone. Kelly, you had a very similar experience when you got out of school. Well, I'll tell all of you, my sister was class of 2009, which prior to this was just about the worst time you could ever graduate. She's kicking butt now. Uh, I don't know how much of the details I'm allowed to share. Works with uh, one of the you know biggest basketball teams in the country. I graduated in 07. That was a bull market. Everybody was getting a job on Wall Street. Guess what? A lot of people weren't meant to work on Wall Street. A couple years later, guys, they were laid off. And it's really hard to be laid off right out of college. It's even harder if you've already moved somewhere. It's been a couple of years. You know, it's just, it's hard to start your life now, but you're still young enough. As everything that Jim's been saying, you have so much time ahead of you, and no one's going to judge you for having happened to graduate during this pandemic. Well, the class of 2020 needs some advice, and who better to go to? Who would navigate this better for finding a job than one of my absolute favorites? It's Dan Roth, editor-in-chief of LinkedIn. Dan, welcome, and what do we do here? Uh, thank you so much for having me on. First of all, Kelly and Jim, thanks for doing this show. This is so important. And to the graduates, I would say congratulations on accomplishing what you've accomplished. This is an incredibly rough environment. Kelly is right. You have a long time ahead of you. The, you will look back on this as stories that have built you up but you want to know what to do today. I've got some advice for all of you, and it kind of all ties together. Number one is you want to make sure that you, are, you have some kind of side hustle going. So, Tarek, I would say you had your dream job. It is not possible right now to get your dream job, or if it's not possible right now, just get a job. you got to get any job. You can work online if that's an option, uh, be an online tutor. There's all kinds of – we're seeing that there are new uh, virtual jobs that are available. The companies are in demand. If you can go and tutor, just get a job. And then on the side, work in theater. Find the things that you want to do that truly are you're passionate about, and maybe one day those two come together. But you got to get out there, and you got to have something on your profile that says that you're working. That's one. Mm -hmm. Denny, I would say to you, look, this is, uh, I think it's incredible that you're already being creative and you're trying to help people in your community and you're shooting, you're being a one woman uh, production crew. You got to do more of it. You have to brand yourself. I would go out there and make sure that you have a really strong profile on LinkedIn where you're creating content, YouTube, uh, Insta, do it everywhere and, and just become your own brand. People will hire you. There's a whole generation that doesn't know how to do what you're doing and they know they have to. So they are looking for people that can show them how to make it happen. Um, Sydney, gain those transferable skills. If your dream job isn't available right now, that's okay. Seek out the industries and opportunities that will get you those skills. And I think you'll find something that you never expected to have, You, but it's going to be an unusual path to get there. And then finally, uh, Juvie, I would say, look, be ready. Gain experience where you can. The fashion industry, as you know better than anyone, has been hit incredibly hard by the pandemic. But business hasn't stopped you got to keep networking and get that elevator pitch ready. Have your own, have, be your own brand. Same, same advice. Hustle, create, make sure that you are showing off what you do and what you know. You guys are, are part of a generation that knows how to create more than any generation before. You believe in this. You know how to, how to be your own brand. you got to take advantage of that. That's what I would say. Uh, thank you so much, Dan. I wish I had that advice. I wish, I wish there was LinkedIn when I got out of school. Anyway, guys, <laughs> you are now set up for success, but there is one thing you need to remember. Mask up! <laughs> now go conquer the world, you tough class of uh, 2020. That was great advice. I totally echo that, Dan. Thank you so much. Let's head out west now to meet Glenda West. She's a small business owner in Seattle. She owns a construction company with her wife. They lost half of their business due to the pandemic. Glenda is here tonight. Glenda, welcome. We are thrilled to have you. We want to help. Let's talk about your plan. You wanted to retire in 10 years. You're worried now about making that happen, right? Yes, we were, uh, my wife and I, Juliana, we were on a strong trajectory, 10 years. We were going to be retired. We've been putting aside 10% of our income. Uh, when the stay-at-home order came, we were suddenly slashed in half. We didn't have the revenue that we had. Only work we were allowed to do was essential work. And now we're looking, saying, are we going to be able to retire? Yeah. Glenda, you told us there is one personal finance expert that you've been following for years. 
and we have brought her here to help you tonight. Susie Orman is author of The Ultimate Retirement Guide for 50 Plus. It's only her 10th consecutive New York Times bestseller. <laughs> She's also host of the hit podcast Women and Money. Susie, we're thrilled to have you back. Welcome back to CNBC tonight. I know you've been doing some homework on Glenda. What should she do? I, I have. Glenda, I need you to listen to me. Because you've been following me for so long, what's fabulous is let's not look at what you don't have, let's look at what you do have. You have a 12-month emergency fund, you own your home outright, you have a will, you have a trust, and you have money. And so what's interesting is I know one of your biggest fears is that in 10 years you wanted to have $2 million and you're afraid that you won't have $2 million. Well, girlfriend, let me talk to you for a second. You will always have to hope for the best, but plan for the worst. You told us that you still think that you can put away $100,000 a year for the next 10 years. You currently have $1 million in a retirement account so and other savings. But So just listen to me closely. Let's say we were wrong. You couldn't put $100,000 a year away. You could only put $50,000 a year away. And let's just say that all you could make on that would be two and a half percent annual average rate of return. In 10 years, you would still have $1.8 million. Hey, if you could do 5% annual average rate of return, you would have 2.3 million. And if by chance you can continue to put $100,000 a year away, girlfriend, at two and a half percent, you'd have $2.4 million and at 5%, 2.9 million. And I think Jim would agree with me that these are not exorbitant rates of return that aren't possible. So what's key here, the key here is what are you invested in? Not how much money you have, but where is your money invested? I've got to tell you, Glenda, you just got the expert. Uh, what do you think of that advice? You're a working person uh, because I've always worshipped what Susie has to say. How are you going to put it in place? I think that this is great. I mean, I'm so excited that I feel like my goals are going to be met. I was afraid they wouldn't be, and now I feel like my future is still set where I thought I might have lost my future. Well, let me just say something to you, girlfriend. Number one, you're going to get a copy of my book, right? The Ultimate Retirement Guide for 50 Plus Winning Strategies to Make Your Money Last a Lifetime. And I signed it for you, if you can see it there, wherever it is. But the best thing is, after this is all over, after you've read the book, you and me are going to have a one on one session so I can go through everything with wow. you and make sure that you are absolutely okay. In fact, that you're more than okay. Well, that is Susie. Uh, Glenda, we got to wish you the best of luck. And Susie, there is nobody like you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. Oh, I miss you, Susie. And I know you're going to continue to work with Glenda. And for all of you at home, let's just say you got to do this. You got to do this for me. You got to go to SusieOrmanAudio.com. That's SusieOrmanAudio.com to stream the ultimate retirement guide for 50 plus. You will not get any better information and advice then Susie Orman is going to give you. <laughs> Coming up next, don't go anywhere. We're going to hear from a veteran in Atlanta. She had to dip into her emergency savings just to make ends meet. What she needs to do to rebuild her financial path forward. We're back right after this. Welcome back to the CNBC Town Hall event. We're taking your financial questions live right now. Go to Facebook.com slash CNBC for more advice. And for our Spanish-speaking audience, go to Facebook.com slash Noticias Telemundo. You can find the same there. All right. Let's now turn to our next guest. So she's a vet who served her country for eight years. She's a fighter. She's a titan. Here is her story. My name is Michelle Lewis. I'm 32 years old, and I live in Atlanta, Georgia. I do real estate for a living, and one aspect I absolutely love about my job is getting people back on their feet, reinventing themselves, starting anew in a new city, because I know what it's like to want a new beginning. I joined the military when I was 17 years old. We deployed to Crit, Iraq, so I went from being in high school, still living with mom and dad, to like, I'm fully suited on a security team doing missions. We're jumping, we're rucking, 6 a.m., you're up, we're fighting, we're training, 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 training. And you gotta think, I joined the military when I was a little girl. It was intense. The military just brought a different animal out of me. 
I come from a military family. We call ourselves the Lewis Lions. We stand for strength, resilience, and the courage not to give up. And that's like who I became in the military. I did eight years, and then when I got out, that transition was very difficult. It was a culture shock going from such a high level of performance. I was a staff sergeant in the Army, like, I was a big dog, and I missed that tenacity, that grit. When I found fitness and powerlifting, being able to compete, being at that level with other athletes that want to be the best, it gave me my power back. Wow. Michelle joins us now. Michelle, thank you so much for your service. First of all, I, eight years, a staff sergeant in Iraq. I mean, just thank you so much for everything that you've done for this country. I know you're coming to us live from your hometown of Atlanta tonight. That city has been hit really hard by the coronavirus. Georgia just reported its second highest number of new cases, half of them coming from Atlanta. It's been really tough in your neck of the woods in particular. We just heard you talking about power. You say you lost some of your power due to the pandemic. Tell us about that. Yes, definitely. Um, thank you, first and foremost, for having me. Um, so the pandemic, definitely, uh, I took such a big financial hit, as I'm sure many Americans did. My real estate slowed down. I actually took the Instacart, though, to uh, try to bring in some of that revenue that I missed out on. Um, with COVID and the pandemic, uh, properties were no longer touring. I literally stopped closing all deals. So I had to definitely get back out there. The military definitely gave me that grit to be able to deliver groceries. That's what Instacart is. And um, I'm refocusing now, regrouping, and trying to get everything back together since the pandemic and everything. Well, we got to thank you for your service, Michelle. And I got to tell you, I'm listening to your story. You are a fighter. You are a warrior. And you know sacrifice. And that landed you, landed you on NBC's hit show, The Titan Games. <laughs> tell us about that. Oh, wow. That was such an amazing way to kick off 2020. Um, I got a DM from one of the producers of The Titan Show telling me that I should try out. And... I took a leap of faith, and I was there uh, about three months later competing at the Combine with 60 amazing athletes to actually get a, a slot on the show. And it, let me tell you, it was such a humbling, amazing, invigorating experience. You're a star. All right, let's head to Dallas. <laughs> we introduce you to another champion. She has three Olympic medals and is a member of the CNBC Financial Advisor Council. Let's welcome in Lauren Williams, founder and CEO of Worth Winning. Lauren, you've been working with Michelle on her finances. What's the winning plan here? Michelle, it's so good to be able to talk to you. I, too, come from a military family where I have a niece, a nephew, and a sister that are currently serving. So I'm truly honored to be able to give some tips and advice to a fellow service member. Um, so we do have some tips and advice for you. And the first one was to increase your savings. So that emergency fund that you had saved you during this pandemic. Uh, but as an entrepreneur, it's important to increase your saving as much as possible because we have fluctuating income. So I wanted you to get your emergency savings up to around uh, $15,000. And that's a six-month uh, six emergency fund. So when you have fluctuating income, you have that to, to fall back on, not just in your personal finances, but also in your business finances. It creates a lot more stability. That number can be a little bit overwhelming for people. So what do you do? You can either increase uh, your saving or you can de decrease expending, decrease your spending. So what you decided to do was start doing Instacart and increase your income, and it was a great idea. One other idea I have for you as it pertains to increasing income at a time like this uh, is Airbnb experiences. So you can use your training expertise, you can use your motivational aspects to be able to share right virtually from your own home and be able to earn income to build that emergency fund or just to close the income gap during that time. Lauren, Another thing that was really important that we... Yeah, Lauren... One of the other things that ahead, we talked about was building your business uh, account. So separating right. income. Imagine you're a coffee shop owner. If you have a coffee shop, you want your cashier every night to, to have the right amount in their register. Uh, you can't just go in because you're the owner and stick your hand in. So my recommendation for you is to get a business account because a business account is going to separate your income out and then you can pay yourself a fixed amount every single month and then that can be with your expenses. So in real estate, like you said, income fluctuates quite a bit. When you get a big commission check in, that doesn't change the plan and that doesn't change your monthly expenses. What you want to do is continue to pay yourself a set amount every single month so that you can continue to build and save as planned. The other thing I wanted you to do was to get a business savings account. 
The reason is you got to put some money aside for taxes. So taxes is something that throws entrepreneurs off quite a bit. And if you have money come in and you go ahead and set that money aside for taxes right out the gate, um, instead of letting it flow into a different account, you know you're going to be good to go and you're not going to owe Uncle Sam when it's time to pay him. This is gold medal advice. The third thing that I think is really important, gold Michelle. Gold medal advice. Uh, go ahead. I, I want to hear if Michelle thinks this is all achievable. Lauren, go ahead. What's your last piece of advice? The third thing I'd like you to do, Michelle, is to in, is look at investing. So we talked about you having a Roth IRA, and a Roth IRA is a really cool thing to be able to take advantage of. So as an entrepreneur, there's lots of options. There's a SEP IRA, there's a solo 401k, um, there's a traditional IRA, and you can get overwhelmed and just say, you know, never mind, I'll look at all this later. But if you don't want to say, wait and look at it later, you want to say, okay, I'm going to go ahead and look at this now. Um, and I'm going to take advantage of what I have. So keep it simple when it comes to investing and look at the Roth IRA that you already have. So my recommendation is to start putting money in there uh, so that you have money to be able to set aside for your future in addition to what we're trying to work on right now in the, in the present. Thank you so much. Lord, I got to tell you, I screwed up on that. I used a personal checking account when I started my first business. I should never have done that. It got me in so much trouble. I wish I had had you when I first started my company. So thank you so much. And Michelle, I got some advice for you. Although you really don't really need it, I want you to stay strong. We'll all be rooting for you when you compete on the Titan Games. What a show. This Monday at 8 p.m. Eastern on NBC. There was a ton of great advice in there. That was awesome. And throughout the night, you've been seeing some of our homegrown heroes on the bottom of your screen. Our partners at Acorns, they wanted to put a face to some of these names and have you meet four of them in particular. Take a look. I just live day to day to try to help people and uplift people during these hard times. We've been uh, sending out food to 150 families so far, and it's all done with donations. There's so much bad news. I was just thrilled to see something positive. Once you take that first step, the hard work becomes so much easier. She was teaching five days a week and doing, you know, a lot. I knew that my community was suffering the greatest. I realized I can do something. She is one of the greatest people that I've had enter my life in the past year, and I'm, I'm so thankful. To hear more about these homegrown heroes, head to grow.acorns.com. Acorn CEO Noah Kerner, who was just on Mad Buddy not that long ago, has a special message for these four heroes. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Let's meet another homegrown hero. Brian Taylor is owner of the Harlem Doggy Day Spa. He responded to the pandemic by doing good for his community by offering his pet care services for neighbors in need. Brian joins us tonight with one of his clients. Uh, but nice pink tongue there. Uh, but what's the, what's his name? It's her name. Her name is Cheryl. Cheryl, it is great to have you both here. Brian, how has the virus impacted your business? Oh my God, the virus has been impacting my business since the beginning of uh, March. I lost 80% of my business. A lot of my businesses, uh, doggy daycare and uh, boarding services, because most of our clients, you know, they work at, you know, big corporations, you know, they work from home starting in March. So because of that, I lost a lot of people who wanted to use our services for doggy daycare. And then most people didn't travel anymore, so we didn't have any more cage-free boarding services. So unfortunately, I had to let go a lot of my staff, and I just revamped and started offering grooming services. Since I started my business as a dog groomer, uh, for every grooming that I did, I was able to then raise money through donations for my clients, where then I'll give grooming services at no cost to people who are struggling because of the pandemic. Wow. So I... I, I raised over $2,000, and I was like, you know what? I got to help more people. So I got some of my grooming pals to come together with me, and now we're traveling across the country, and we're going to be helping on many pet parents who are struggling because of the pandemic, and we're going to offer free grooming services for them. And there's been a business model shift in here, Brian, that tells us about how a lot of people are responding to the pandemic. So we saw the vans. Like you said, you started by doing a lot of boarding, a lot of people who were traveling. Now, what do you think the future of your business looks like? Honestly, I got to find a way to bring my business to the doorstep of uh, our pet parents. 
because there's still the fear of leaving their home and their pets are part of their family. So I'm thinking of ways where I can knock on doors and be able to help and service our pet parents at their doorstep. All right, Brian, your next step is to figure out how to scale your business. We got to yeah. make this much bigger. Who could do this better? Let's bring in Gary Vaynerchuk, old friend, founder and CEO of VaynerMedia, <laughs> self-made millionaire, unbelievably fabulous guy. Gary, so great to see you. What's your advice for Brian? Jim, great to see you. Brian, listen, I think you need to virtually knock on doorsteps, right? I, I, I love everywhere you're going. The speed and the pivot was remarkable. I'm so proud of you on that. Not crying about what happened, but attacking a different opportunity. I think Nextdoor is a social network that is exploding quietly on the scene that's neighborhood oriented. If you start running ads in that ecosystem and then go to that neighborhood, you're gonna have demand as you come through. You can get the RSVPs in that area. That's also a huge strength of Facebook. And as you know, right now, some of the biggest brands in the world are not advertising on you know, Facebook, which means the prices are down and that's when entrepreneurs and small businesses like yours attack because you're getting more awareness. So to me, it's attack an area, whether it's Harlem or East Side, Upper West Side, you wanna go to Westchester, the van can move, run ads for a week ahead of time, get the RSVPs and then come in. This that sounds is, like a really good Yeah, Gary, yeah, I gotta tell you, I didn't know you knew next door. I was gonna suggest next door to him because that's Sarah Fryer. She comes on my show a lot. And it is, I think, a fantastic way to connect with the neighborhood. Brian, you gotta do, I'm talking about doing this stuff. What do you think, Gary? Tomorrow, this evening, right? Look, I mean, I'm empathetic. What's amazing about Nextdoor and Facebook is I'm empathetic. You know, you know, my dad is the great American story. He built a small business, came here with nothing. So I'm empathetic to that zero point. I think yesterday, but I also know, and this is why it's so powerful, that that's a 40 or $50 ad spent. You know, brought, like, I'm empathetic for, to you. You know, you're get, you got hit, a lot of people got hit. And so small businesses, you know, restaurants, what have you, the answer is tomorrow, but I'm also not looking for those Pepsi or Budweiser budgets. I'm looking for $88 to do on the Upper West Side, get seven people, start building slowly. This is a patience game and a reset. Brian, what do you think? That sounds like a really good idea. I'm definitely gonna put some of that into play immediately because my business is a people business and the more they know that we service pets it will really help with the um you know with the cost because I, Brian, I'll get a return on my on my money and, and because I'm desperate to get as much value for you and all everybody at home right now who's dealing with similar situations also Instagram story ads Google it Instagram story ads because we don't have that much time here you can do swipe up ads that can go right to your RSV RSVP page. You can do that within a one mile radius or a town that you want to drive the van to and get the, and literally spend $88 on those swipe up ads and convert three people, which will give you real ROI against that $88. Look, Jim, you know this. We've been talking about social for a decade on my wine show when I've been on your show. It is grossly underpriced attention and the people that are best practitioners with little money get huge ROI returns. It, it, it's so true, Brian. You've got to go into these niche Facebook products and the Instagram stories. I had Cheryl Sandberg on, she's a COO, talking about this. I think it's one of the reasons why I've been recommending Facebook. And I recommend it because I think it is so darn cheap for you, Gary, that it's just, it's, it's imperative. I cannot, they're giving the space away and you're gonna connect directly with the people. How soon can you put this plan in place? Immediately, I, I need some business in my door. So definitely, I'm gonna go in tonight and look for some of the best posts that I've done really well and I'm gonna put some money behind it. And, and Brian, right now, this is a meta moment. This is not for everybody at home, but guess what? The serendipity of life took over for you. You got this moment. You go on Twitter right after this, take screenshots of you being on CNBC and use that as the ad. You can literally target Gary Vaynerchuk fans literally for $100 with a picture of this to convert the conversion. How do I do that? I need to do that right now. How do I do that? You go on Twitter, you literally search CNBC. Everyone's talking about this show on Twitter. Kudos to the hosts, they're incredible. Literally, there's clearly, like America, right now, take a screenshot of this and post it on Twitter so that Brian can go in there and take that photo and then use that as the ad on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook and next door. Include me, at Jim Kramer. I want to be included <laughs> in this. You know, you can include me, but it's not going to get you very far. You, you got to include Jim. That, that'll, Gary, I, I, I was going to ask you about the balance for Brian's attention between he's also trying to do this endeavor to help people. He's raising money. He wants to make sure people who can't afford it, you know, 
but but that takes every is every attention he spends on that. I mean, should he be should be focusing 100% on the business? Or you know, these ideas are great. If you got any more, keep them coming. Look, you know, I never tell someone how to dictate what they want to do in life, but I always remind people, you're not going to help anybody if you're out of business. Then because because you're going to be focused on yourself. I, I love this man. This is why I'm so fired up that. I got him in this interaction, the altruism, the kindness, that always works, um, but he has to balance it. And and look, hard work is about to get very popular again. And so to me, if we were just chumming it up, I would say, look, good news, you can do three hours of giving back and you can do 11 hours of trying to stay alive. And that's unfortunately reality. And by the way, there's so many restaurants and small businesses watching right now, so many of which completely underestimate the power of $100 spend on these platforms, but it is game changing. We didn't have big budgets at Wine Library when we started and you build from there. And that was Google and email. That new version today is the seven to eight social networks that are out there specifically for this gentleman's business. It is Facebook, Instagram, next door. Holy cow, this is such the greatest place I can't up. This whole show is unbelievable. You know what? Thank you to Brian and to Gary V, who knows more about Thank social you. than anybody, including Zuckerberg. All right? Okay, <laughs> we'll be right back. Thanks to our partners at Acorns, and thanks for watching. What a great night. For more, go to CNBC.com slash invest in you. Shark Tank starts right now.